chaos that can arise from unmuting your videos uh, or audios. Uh, and please keep all of your videos off, as, as, except anyone who has been told to keep their videos on. Uh, so let's begin with the event. Uh, we have various students from around the world at various levels of the education. Uh, so therefore, to provide everyone with an overview, uh, professor of, overview of to Professor James Peebles' work, we have Sharuri, who will be explaining the same uh, for 20 minutes, post which the discussion session will begin. So, Sharvari, over to you. So, hello everyone. I am Sharvari Naik. I am from MSc Part 2 from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. I am currently working on my master dissertation, which is in the field of cosmology. I plan to compare the primordial power spectrum from inflation, which is density variation in the early universe and it is considered as the structure, seeds for the structure of the universe. I'll be comparing it with the latest uh, data from Planck Telescope. So, and I would like to thank Society of Physics and Department of Physics for this wonderful opportunity. Personally, it's a dream came true for me to talk about the work of such a respected scientist. So, greetings from the Society of Physics. One is doing well. The Department of Physics and the Society of Physics, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, presents an interactive session with Professor Philip James Edwin Peebles, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in year 2019. I will greet, give a brief on life of Professor Peebles, his area of interest his life work and his current interests. Professor Peebles was born on 25th April 1935 in Winnipeg, Canada. After attending the University of Manitoba, uh, he continued his studies and went to university in the United States. This is in 1962 under his thesis advisor, Professor Bob Dickey. He remained University, where he is now the Professor Emeritus of Science. He was at Princeton University when he received his award for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology. Along with the prestigious Nobel Prize, Professor Peebles have achieved a lot of merits. A few of the awards he received are the Order of Manitoba, the Dirac Medal, the Crawford Prize, the Shaw Prize, and many more. The uh, areas of interest of Professor Peebles have been pondering about fundamental questions about the universe's history. Professor Peebles is interested in very early universe, Big Bang Theory. He has been in the field of physical cosmology to determine the origins of the universe. This theoretical framework developed since mid 1960s is the basis of our contemporary ideas about the universe. The cosmic background radiation is a remaining trace of the form formation of the universe. Using his theoretical tools and calculations, Professor James Peebles predicted the cosmic microwave pattern, formation and evolution of large scale structures, dark matter and dark energy. Here we can see the composition of the universe. It shows us a universe in which just 5% of its content is known matter. The rest, 95%, is unknown. Dark matter and dark energy contribute 25% and 70% respectively. Peebles was studying physical cosmology and has done much to establish its respectability. Peebles said it was not a single step, some critical discovery that suddenly made cosmology relevant, but the field gradually emerged through a number of experimental observations. Clearly, one of the most important during my career was the detection of cosmic microwave background radiation that immediately attracted the attention of most experimentalists interested in measuring the properties of this radiation and theorists who joined in analyzing the implications. 
his shop price citation states he laid the foundation for almost all modern investigations in cosmology both theoretical and observational transforming a highly speculative field into a precision science so now let's take a look at wonderful journey to the nobel discovery in the 1960s professor dickey's group was working on theoretical predictions and the corresponding observational consequences for the state of the primordial universe the phase that immediately follows the big bang lasting for a few hundred thousand years at that time the big bang theory for the formation of universe was not yet fully accepted despite observational evidence that galaxies were moving away from each other professor dickey group was working on the theory that if the universe was expanding then it must have been much smaller hotter and denser in the past the prediction was that the thermal radiation from this epoch might be still observable today as background radiation pervading the universe the princeton group who was also designing instruments to try to detect it meanwhile in 1960s arno penzias and robert wilson working for bell labs had detected an unusual persistent background noise in their experiment when penzias and wilson approached the kids group for advice it became detected the relic background radiation they call it the cosmic microwave background because the radiation peaks in the microwave with the electromagnetic spectrum in 1965 shortly after penzias and wilson peebles professor dickey and two colleagues laid out the basic explanation of what the cmb is and how it relates to the big bang they argued that the light had propagated through space almost since the beginning growing fainter and less energetic over as the expansion of space stretched it out in that hot early epoch pairs of electrons and pairs of neutrinos could have spontaneously materialized leading to synthesis of protons and neutrons and when these protons and neutrons came together they formed atomic nuclei in 1966 professor peebles made detailed calculation of abundances of different isotopes that would have been produced in this process known as big bang nucleosynthesis he calculated the relative amounts of deuterium helium 3 and helium 4 by inferring the primordial density of neutrons and protons from temperature of the cmb as both theory and observation of the cmb improved professor peebles and other theorists gave confidence that the early density of protons and neutrons paled next to that of a different kind of matter now known as the dark matter that did not readily interact except through gravity now let's talk about the cosmic microwave background and how it tells us about the past of our universe about 13.8 billion years ago the universe began to expand as we know it we call this the big bang the expansion formed time space and matter as we know them at the time the universe was extremely hot and like a thick impenetrable glowing gas of elementary particles such as electrons quarks and photons 400000 years later after the big bang a radiation was left behind professor james peebles was awarded the nobel prize in physics for calculating the properties of this radiation today we can still detect the remnants of this radiation which we call the cosmic background radiation after a while the hot matter cooled electrons neutrons and protons tried to form atoms but the photons collided with the atoms and prevented their formation however as the matter cooled further more and more atoms were able to form after another few hundred thousand years most of the electrons had formed stable atoms together with the nuclei sound waves started to affect the pores like consistency and the fused and unequal structures were formed gravity together the dark matter caused these structures to start forming the precursor to galaxies 
the universe continued to expand and to cool photons earlier gave the universe a glowing orange color the expansion of the universe changed the photons wavelength into one we can no longer see no now the stars had formed so no stars had formed yet in these newly formed galaxies so there was no visible light we call this the dark ages in the dark ages gravity caused galaxies to begin to rotate around each other and form bigger clusters these galaxies mainly consisted of hydrogen gas held together by gravity after about 400 million years hydrogen atoms in the dark galaxies began to be squeezed together by gravity forming helium from hydrogen as a result of fusion this the reaction released large quantities of energy and heated the gas so it began to glow the universe had gained it its first star now let's go through the basics of theory that predicted there is something pushing the universe since 1916 albert einstein's theory of relativity is basis of all calculation concerning our universe but when he solved his own equations he wasn't so sure whether they were right so his so called field equations led to the conclusion that our universe is expanding since this contract since this sorry since this contradicted with the common knowledge at that time added a constant term to his equations the famous cosmological constant which acted as a counterbalance after solving the new equations the conclusion was that the universe stood still over 10 years later experimental observation showed that indeed our universe is expanding so there was no need for his counteracting constant anymore and it was discarded einstein called this his biggest blunder later did you know that his constant would return after a century later but first let's talk about the dark stuff dark matter and dark energy first off why are they called dark well that's because we cannot see them the way our vision works is that photons interact with the things around us and they reflect them into our eyes this makes us see the objects however if there is no or almost no interaction with photons none of them can be reflected into our eyes and therefore we don't see anything that's the thing with dark matter and dark energy we know that they are there but no one has ever seen them the difference between dark matter and dark energy is one pulls one pushes let's see how the presence of the dark matter was first found in the 1930s experiments measured the rotational speed of some far away galaxies from this from this speed they calculated the mass of the galaxy but after adding masses of all the orbiting objects the result was too small the conclusion was that there had to be some additional mass that holds the galaxy together but for some reason we cannot see it that's dark matter we now estimate that 26% of our universe is dark matter and in 1962 james peebles was one of the physicists who proposed a mechanism how we could explain the situation called cold dark matter in order to understand dark energy we have to talk a little about curvature einstein's general theory of relativity tells us that mass and energy have an effect on how our space is curved there are basically three possibilities for this curvature one is that the universe is flat this happens when the amount of mass and energy in our universe is just right at a very precise so called critical value in such a universe two parallel lines would go on forever without touching the other option when we have too much matter and energy results in a so called closed universe where two parallel lines will eventually meet somewhere an extreme example of this would be the surface of a sphere 
even if we start with two parallel lines somewhere they will eventually meet at the top of the sphere the final option when we have too little mass and energy is called open universe when two parallel lines will eventually drift further and further apart well experimental measurements as well as theoretical consideration gives us a clear answer the universe is flat so now how all of this relates to the dark stuff this means that we apparently have just the right amount of matter and energy in our universe however when we look at our universe even if we count the stuff we cannot see like dark matter we only reach 30% of its critical value this means 70% is missing here again professor peebles was one of the leading scientists who proposed the solution in 1984 he reintroduced einstein cosmological constant which was now seen as the energy of free space the energy of vacuum this together with ordinary matter and cold dark matter is enough to support the calculation of a flat universe however this was still just a theory on where the missing 70% of our universe is in 1998 experiments showed us that our universe is not only growing but doing so in an accelerated manner calculations show that ordinary matter was not able to cause this so something else was responsible for pushing our universe apart by assuming the dark energy is responsible for accelerated expansion of our universe it quickly goes from just a theory to something that could be investigated in experiments this was brief about all the discoveries made by professor peebles Now let's see what he is currently working on. Professor Peebles continued to work in physical cosmology with preference to underappreciated issues. Here are three examples. Isolated galaxy. This is interesting as standard cosmological model predicts more isolated galaxies than dark matter halos. It would be interesting to confirm this observationally and if it's otherwise to explain why is it so. your disk system this allows us to observe stars in the early universe and uh, it seems to aggregate in galactic bulges and stellar halos currently observed stellar concentrations are in bars or disks this discrepancy is yet to be explained nearby galaxy motions proper motion of galaxy and contents of galaxy is an important avenue for exploration especially as we have detailed understanding of only the milky way and few others hence knowing mass concentrations is a gateway to knowing if the galaxy was put together by gravity doing all the research and reading about his work interviews i came across this one answer that he gave when asked what a single discovery or breakthrough from his long career that would put the nobel award in context he replied it's a life work this show how big of the contribution he have made to the field one of the statement that i found fascinating is professor people said i think i'd be depressed if everything were nearly all known but i don't feel any danger of that happening this is so true the joy of exploring and finding new thing is the biggest with such an inspirational statement by professor peebles let's start with the interactive session thank you all have a great time uh thank you shabri for that interesting session uh so i'd like to first apologize for the uh, audio issues if there were any uh as you all know this is these are covid times very uncertain times we are all at home and you never know even if you have an excellent internet connection you never know if it uh, you know slips uh, past or you know it doesn't work so thank you shabri for that very great session uh, professor peebles has already joined the chat uh, the meeting 
I hope he also liked the meet. He will sh shortly uh, start uh, with the meeting. So before that, uh, before we begin the discussion, we have an esteemed alum of St. Xavier's College and one of the co-founders of the Society of Physics here to introduce the society. Uh, so Kurt, over to you. Hi, good evening everyone uh, uh, joining us from India and um, around there and good morning to everyone joining us from uh, the West, the US, Canada. Um, today is a monumental moment in, uh, in the history of physics at St. Xavier's. Um, the Society of Physics uh, is a student-run organization um, with very humble beginnings um, whose aim was basically one thing, uh, to work with the Department of Physics to enhance and to make physics education extremely multifaceted and, um, and holistic. Um, in addition to the theory and practical uh, classes that the department offers, uh, the Society of Physics um, basically organizes events, seminars, podcasts, publications, and many other activities, um, not only to ignite the spark of physics um, in, in new people, but also to maintain and to keep that fire burning, the, 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 the love for physics burning. Um, the college and the Department of Physics has always encouraged the students to, uh, to push and to move forward and to pursue this goal. And today we have a strong group of students and many alumni um, that now has culminated in this amazing um, activity and event where we get to speak to Professor James Peebles. Um, it was um, Newton who said that if I have seen further, it is because I've stood on the backs of, on the shoulders of giants. Today we get to meet one such giant. And I want to thank the Department of Physics and the and St. Xavier's College um, and the Society of Physics for organizing this event. And we believe that this is one of many, many great occasions uh, to, to come. Um, I'd like to extend my most earnest, earnest gratitude to Professor Peebles mm -hmm. for gracing us with his uh, presence here. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, so now we have the principal of our college, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, Dr. Rajendra Shinde, uh, here to welcome our esteemed guest, Professor James Peebles. So if you... Very uh, good evening or good morning or whatever the time zone you are living in to the students and faculty members present here. Welcome to St. Xavier's College Autonomous Mumbai. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Society of Physics, St. Xavier's College for organizing such a such a wonderful event a discussion with a giant personality in physics. I would like to extend our, that is mine as well as the college, warm welcome to Professor Peebles, the Nobel Laureate in Physics 2019, and our today's guest speaker. Uh, today's, pro today's talk organized by this Society of Physics interaction with Nobel Laureate Professor Peeble. I consider this as a great honor for St. Xavier's College and great opportunity for our students and faculty. It is unfortunate to not to have Professor Peebles in person on our campus due to this global pandemic. But thanks to the technology, which has provided this opportunity to interact with him virtually. <clears throat> Professor Peebles, St. Xavier's College, ever since its establishment in the year 1869, founded by the Jesuits, has remained an iconic institution of higher education, playing its role in nation building in India. St. Xavier's is known to be an educational institution 
which constantly strives to create future leaders who will demonstrate innovation in their professional competencies integration in their personal lives and inclusion in their social contribution the college offers 28 undergraduate 10 postgraduate and 9 phd programs in the faculty of science arts and commerce under its umbrella along with academic excellence st xavier's endeavors to contribute to the necessary transformation of the pre- prevailing social conditions too the core ethos of the college is to uphold the principles of social justice equality of opportunity genuine freedom and respect for religious and moral values human dignity and self respect we are constantly striving towards making a committed and significant contribution towards inclusivity across various principles our college stands among top 100 in the national ranking according to the survey of education world we are the ranked number 1 in india among the private autonomous colleges with the support of academic autonomy since 2010 we have been able to design our courses learning experiences and evaluations to more relevant interdisciplinary and innovative challenging our students to work hard and earn their degrees credits and honor certificates while simultaneously honing their soft skills coping strategies and creative potential all of this is being achieved within the value based framework of ignitian pedagogy paradigm at st xavier's i am sure our students and faculty are eagerly waiting to interact with you professor and not with me Once again I welcome you to the St Xavier's College. Over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you sir. Uh, so now we have our uh, head of the department of physics, uh, Professor Jyoti Singh who will be introducing uh, our professor or uh, Professor James Peets. Uh yeah. Uh, thank you Kevin and uh, I would uh, like to uh, introduce professor peebles although a lot was said uh, by shervati i would put in my two pennies worth in introducing the speaker but i would like to start by saying that i had the privilege to listen to your keynote address sir professor peebles at the international conference on gravitation and cosmology in 2011 at goa in southern india that was another time when enormous effort went into getting the paperwork done and visa arranged before we could hear you in person today the pandemic has made it possible for these young students to arrange an interactive session with you in our evening and your morning so indeed the world has come much closer with the advent of uh, technology uh, i would uh, make an attempt to introduce uh, the speaker Uh, for today's session professor peebles through his work uh, at the risk of repeating the information that is already given by sherwari uh, one half of 2019 physics nobel prize was awarded to professor peebles for his pioneering contribution to developments in cosmology i would like to read the citation for this award and it reads and i quote James Peebles' insights into the physical cosmology have enriched the entire field of research and laid a foundation for the transformation of cosmology over the last 50 years from speculation to science. His theoretical framework, developed since the mid-1960s, is the basis of our contemporary ideas about the universe. The Big Bang model describes the universe from its very first moments almost 14 billion years ago. and it was extremely hot and dense since then the universe has been expanding becoming larger and colder barely 400000 years after the big bang the universe became transparent and light rays were able to travel through space even today this ancient radiation is all around us and co- coded into it 
many of the universe's secrets are hiding. Using his theoretical tools and calculations, James Peebles was able to interpret these traces from the infancy of the universe and discover new physical processes. The results showed us a universe in which just 5% of its content is known, the matter which constitutes stars, planets, trees, and us. The rest, 95%, is unknown, dark matter, and dark energy. This is a mystery and a challenging modern challenge to modern physics. Uh, let me expand this description uh, a little more. Uh, I would say for centuries, mankind's view of the universe has been fashioned by a sky full of enormously many stars. The universe was believed to be static, and rightfully so. It looked static. Compare this view of the universe with the one in which one which was described in the Nobel citation I just read, and you can assess how much our view of the cosmos has changed in the last 100 years. And Jim Peebles of Princeton University has been a part of this endeavor for more than half of this that period, since starting 1964. In 1929, Hubble inferred from the redshift of the starlight in distant galaxies that the universe is expanding. At the same time, mathematical solutions of the Einstein's field equations of expanding universe were found, and an era of modern cosmology, uh, which eventually came to be called the Big Bang Cosmology started. But a universe with a beginning was not acceptable to many, and the alternative theory, the steady state cosmology was born. The debate as to whether the universe had a beginning or was steady was settled only much later in 1965 with the discovery of the cosmic background radiation, and Peebles was an important contributor in explaining theoretically its origin. Steady state cosmology was dead overnight, and hot Big Bang physical cosmology was now truly born. And over the next half a century, Peebles played a pioneering role in its development. Peebles refined his earlier calculations of helium abundance from the Big Bang. He investigated the role of background radiation in galaxy formation. He also initiated end body simulations of galaxy formation and introduced the use of the correlation function as a valuable observational tool in cosmology. His 1971 book, The Large Scale Structure of the Universe, served as a Bible for the subject, and many a students have studied that and written their PhD thesis. The 1970 and 1980s marked the discovery of dark matter, interpreted so from the observations of the motion of stars and glass clouds in the outer reaches of the galaxies. What could the dark matter be? Massive neutrinos were popularly proposed as hot dark matter. That means they were relativistic at the time of decoupling. But that model had its problems. In groundbreaking work in 1982, Peebles and two other independent groups all proposed cold dark matter, that is non-relativistic at the time of decoupling, consistent with the data. Since then, CDM of the cold dark matter remains the favored form of dark matter, though we do not know its composition. Three Nobel Prizes have been awarded in observational cosmology. Menzies and Wilson, 1978, for their 1965 discovery of the relic radiation. Mathier and Smoot, 2006, for the CMB spectrum and anisotropy found by the COBE satellite in 1992 and Perlmutter, Rees, and Schmidt, 2011, for the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe in 1998. Remarkably, Jim Peebles has contributed importantly to the theory behind every one of these three prizes. His is a Lifetime Achievement Award for making many important contributions to the theoretical cosmology. Uh, welcome. Professor Peebles to our interactive session today and over to you, Kevin, for proceeding further. Uh, thank you, Jyoti Ma. Uh, so now uh, the person you've been all waiting to hear from. Uh, so before we begin, I think Professor Peebles wanted to inform you guys why exactly he wanted an interaction session with everyone. Uh, so Professor, over to you. Uh, 
Uh, so till Professor P, uh, Professor James Peebles uh, unmutes his uh, unmutes and switches on his switches on his video, uh, I would request everyone to put all uh, put all of your questions in the chat box of YouTube stream or the uh, Google, uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, professor, are you, uh, were you able to, uh, you can click the uh, camera button and then that will. Yes, I think I have it. Okay. No. Uh, no, uh, the, your video is not visible, Professor. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's visible now. Yeah, it's, it is, it is. Hi, Professor. Hi. <clears throat> are, we, are we ready? Yes, Professor, we are live. So I think I should first explain why I requested this arrangement. Through a long career, I have given so many lectures, and I have often felt uneasy about the shortage of time for discussion. It occurred to me to try this experiment because, after all, you people are the one who best know what you would like to hear from me. I also could learn something from this experiment because I would like to know what young people these days are thinking. So it is an experiment. We will see how it goes. But shall we start? Yes, Professor, we can start. Uh, so shall I go on ahead with the first question? Please. Uh, OK, so the first question that we got uh, was a uh, question on gravitational waves. So, Sharvari, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, hello, Professor. Hello. So, my question is, if primordial gravitational waves are discovered, will it be conclusive proof of inflation? If so, how? So difficult to detect. The gravitational waves that would be produced during inflation uh, have amplitude that is highly uncertain because the parameters of inflation are so uncertain. You recall that the gravitational wave amplitude depends on the rate of expansion during inflation. That is an adjustable parameter. So we must remember that physics is built on measurements. This is an experimental subject. The experiments that can be done to test inflation are very scarce. We will be lucky if we can detect clues from inflation that can be readily interpreted. But there is no guarantee of that. We have, in short, no guarantee that we can discover whether inflation really happened. It will depend on the evidence that can be accumulated we will have to see. Uh, all right. Uh, so the next question is so so like uh, when you mentioned LIGO, I remember this paper in 2017. Uh, it showed how primordial black holes would affect uh, LIGO's gravitational waves detection rate due to the merging of the binary pairs. Uh, that yeah. paper, for a momentary stretch of time, soured the relationship with primordial black holes. But the recent paper by Carson suggested that black holes I'm afraid we have lost contact. So, uh, Kevin, oh, repeat so your question. Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry about that. I'll just switch off my video for now. Uh, so, so the question was uh, by Chintan. Chintan has a question on primordial black holes. Oh, yes, sir. So, Professor, my question was this key like primordial, like how can primordial black holes explain something about cold dark matter? Like both originated at the same time. As we know, like cold, cold dark matter was high, like from, it existed from the very beginning of the universe. And so, so, and primordial black holes are supposed to form at also at the very beginning. So what can we, uh, like what can be their interaction? How can primordial black holes explain us about the uh, cold dark matter? So that is my question, Professor. We have to bear in mind that the dark matter is a hypothetical component. 
we pay very close attention to it because with this dark matter assumed, we have many tests that the theory passes. So many tests that I think it's a very good chance that the dark matter is real. Unfortunately, we do not know what it is. One thought, as you say, is primordial black holes. Remember, we have a good, well-tested theory of the evolution of the universe from high density, let us say, from the time of light element formation to the present. But we don't have a, a firm theory of what happened earlier. We don't have enough evidence to establish that. Uh, now we come to the question, given that we require this hypothetical dark matter, what might it be? There are so many possibilities. We require that it not interact much with ordinary matter and radiation, that it not interact too strongly with itself. But that leaves a lot of options. It could be a massive class of neutrinos. It could be primordial black holes. If it is black holes, their mass must be carefully controlled. They must not be too massive, or you would see their destructive influence on the, on, on, on the Milky Way. They cannot have small masses, so they would evaporate. There's lots of room between. You would then love to know, how will we know whether these dark matter is uh, primordial black holes? One possibility is that these black holes would act like gravitational lenses. Do you remember the name Macho? Yes, sir. Mass weekly inter massive, oh, I don't remember what Macho stands for, the search for compact objects. It's not revealed anything interesting. It reveals lots of stars, but not anything like massive black holes. Perhaps with first, further work along this line for searches for weak lensing, uh, there will be found, we will have to see. Meanwhile, we do have mysteries about black holes. In each large galaxy, there is a massive compact object. In our Milky Way, the mass a few times 10 to the six solar masses. How did it get there? A wonderful question. There are ideas, but uh, no really convincing theory. Perhaps those black holes, that's massive in the center of our galaxy, is a black hole. Perhaps it is primeval. It's an odd thought, but we can't rule it out. And it is surprising that massive quasars, which we think were, well, our black hole is a remnant of a massive quasar, were present back at Redshift 10. They appeared awfully early. How did that happen? Well, lots of ideas, but one of them certainly is that it primordial. Wouldn't that be exciting? But we'll yes. have to work to see. Uh, uh, Professor, I remember like this, I wanted to state, uh, I, re I remember your talk after you received the Nobel Prize and there was this Nobel Laureate's lecture in that you mentioned like in the end, like you put this whole entire theory of uh, cosmic microwave background, you worked almost your entire life for it. And then you were forced to make that assumption about the dark matter. And then yeah. you said, even if the whole theory is complete, it paves the way for the next generation. Like it, like for us, it's an opportunity to explore dark matter even further. So like that statement, like it really hits, hits the heart. And I'm literally shaking right now because never in my wildest dream, I thought uh, Professor Peebles would be answering my question. So thank you so much, Professor. Really, like I, I literally, I'm shaking right now. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so, Professor, for the younger uh, audiences, would you uh, explain what exactly is cold dark matter? Um, I did not catch the full 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 words. Uh, what exactly is cold dark matter? We do not know. It has never been detected apart from its gravity. It is a hypothetical component, but one that allows us to make many tests that pass the observations. It is therefore an inferred 
questions. It's very unsatisfactory, perhaps, to claim that we have firm evidence of dark matter, but we don't know what it is. But that's the situation. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so life as we know it is a result of collapse of stars and expansion. Uh, Roger Penrose, is, uh, Penrose put forth a theory of cyclical cosmology, which predicts a loop of much the same, universal collapse and expansion uh, indefinitely. So Ashish has a question related to the same. So Ashish, would you like to go ahead? Uh, good morning to you, sir. My name is Ashish. I am a master's student here. Uh, so my question is, uh, Professor Roger Penrose put in this idea of a conformal cyclic cosmology where uh, the universe undergoes expansion and then it goes back in a sort of aeons. So he put in, he put forward an idea of aeons. So uh, the, a big bang, ha big bang happens and then it collapses and another big bang happens, a new universe starts it. So what are your views on this? There are several lines of thought. <clears throat> are you thinking of Roger Penrose's ideas? Yes, sir. Roger Penrose's idea of conformal cyclic cosmology. Yes, it's a beautiful idea. The tests that I have seen are not very convincing. And so it is an idea we pay attention to. We pursue its implications, but we do not put it forth as a convincing theory, in my opinion, because it is not passed what I would consider uh, convincing tests. Let it be emphasized again. We have a well-tested theory of the evolution of the universe from a very hot, dense, early state to the present. We have that theory because the evolution left fossils, so as to speak. It left, it left evidence of evolution. That evidence is so complete so far that it looks like we have a compelling case. What the universe was doing earlier than that is a matter of speculation. We have the idea of inflation. We have uh, Paul Steinhardt's arguments for what he calls, what is it called now? The, oh, I don't remember. We have Roger Penrose's ideas. These ideas are wonderful. We should, we should admire them all, but we should be careful about assuming that any one of them is on the right track until somehow we can find more evidence. Uh, thank you, sir. I think that answered your question, Ashish. Uh, so, so if you go to see the universe has been expanding since 13.8 billion years. In that time, it's mo moved about 46.6 billion light years. I can't even fathom uh, that distance. Uh, so the next question from Anand also deals with large numbers per se. So Anand, would you like to go ahead? Uh, hello, so uh, my question to you was regarding uh, your thoughts on Dirac large number hypothesis and what would be its and if it turns out to be true. Yes. Uh, it is. <clears throat> we pay attention to, to systematic phenomena, such as the large numbers. Uh, we, we recall that the strength of gravity uh, can be written as Newton's constant, the mass of a nucleon squared divided by Planck's constant and the velocity of light. GM squared over h bar c, 10 to the minus 40, which is a small number. The ratio of the strength of the electromagnetic interaction to the gravitational interaction, that enormous number, 10 to the 40th, it must, it's such a big number that it, as Dirac pointed out many years ago, it is difficult to see how such an enormous number could come out of a fundamental theory which involves quantities like pi and the square root of two. Uh, is there some explanation for this? Particle theorists worry about it too. They call it the hierarchy problem. It's the same problem. Uh, and those who study um, 
to study super string theory and the notion of multiverses. Uh, also wonder about it. Uh, it. It's a puzzle. There is one certain possibility that if this number is large as Dirac had, had noticed, because the universe is all old, and this quantity has been decreasing from a number that might come out of a fundamental theory, but then is rolling towards zero, perhaps we can understand why the number is small now, this ratio of the strength of the, electrom of the magnetic to the electromagnetic interaction, I'm sorry, the gravitational to electromagnetic interaction. If that ratio is small because it has been rolling towards zero, then we ought to see evolution in the strengths of the gravitational interaction as you look at objects of various ages seen at great distance, so they were seen earlier in time. No evidence of that has shown up. There is an ongoing wonderful experiment to monitor the orbit of the planet of, of the moon by lunar laser ranging. They are getting down to remarkably precise ranging. They're finding lots of measurements of the structure of moon and the earth that affect the orbit, but they're not finding any interaction, any evidence of uh, that the strength of the gravitational interaction is decreasing. The old estimate that Planck had, that, 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 that Dirac had, a part in 10 to the 10th per year, is quite excluded by two orders of magnitude. So this large number hypothesis is tantalizing. It's a great puzzle. It might be telling us something very deep about the nature of the universe, but uh, we do not know what. Thank you, sir. Uh, so just like Dirac's large number hypothesis was actually revolutionary. Uh, so Professor, your ideas in cosmology was indeed the same. Uh, and. Indeed, initially, I bet it was a it was difficult convincing the scientific community of this uh, the new concept. So, Asha's question is related to the same. Asha, would you like to go ahead? Uh, good morning, Professor. My name is Asha Anita Shaji. I am in MSc Part One. Uh, my question is: How difficult was it to explain to the scientists all around the world that there is something called the dark matter, or what are the hurdles you faced to, as you said, it was, it's a completely hypothetical uh, object that dark matter is there. So how, how, how is it that you convince so many people all around the world and what are the hurdles you faced in doing so? It is to me always surprising to discover which ideas are resisted and which ideas are welcomed. Not always on rational grounds, I think. I tell you first the example of the question of the mean mass density of the universe. To many, an elegantly constructed universe would have no space curvature because we don't need it for our existence. It would have no cosmological constant. We don't need it. The universe should be what is known as Einstein de Sitter. Uh, it should be expanding, in effect, at just escape velocity. In the, in the mid-1980s through the 1990s, until close to the end, the community of cosmologists, which had by that time grown fairly large, was convinced on the grounds I just mentioned and others that the universe surely has no cosmological constant, no space curvature, it is Einstein to center. The mass density is what is required for expansion at a space speed. I had been doing quite a lot of work on the statistics of the positions and motions of the galaxies, had derived mass density estimates, and consistently concluded that the mass density is only about a third of what is wanted for this elegant universe. I remember great resistance. Um, young people, rather well, annoyed at me because I kept saying, look at the evidence. Uh, but no, no, the evidence points to an ugly universe. I was surprised at the resistance, but not perhaps totally surprised, because elegance often does lead us to aspects of reality. 
simply not in this case. Anyway, uh, it took until the late 1990s before the community swung around to agree with me that the mass density is less than that in the elegant universe. But to come back to dark matter, I introduced the concept in 1982 for what I thought were good reasons. It helped us understand in particular a striking phenomenon. The galaxies are distributed in a distinctly clumpy way. The radiation is remarkably smooth. It's now known that it varies across the sky, a temperature variation in part in 10 to the fifth or a little less than that. How did the radiation remain so smooth as the galaxy distribution grew so clumpy? One solution, which I introduced in 1982, was to postulate that most of the mass of the universe is not baryonic, but dark. That has a wonderfully salubrious effect of allowing the mass that is growing together to form a galaxy to move through the radiation without disturbing it, except by gravity. When plasma moves through the radiation, it pulls on it because of scattering by free electrons. That was the reason I introduced it. The community jumped on the idea. I was disconcerted. They loved the idea for a simple reason, simplicity. If most of the mass of the universe is non-baryonic, then it becomes very easy to understand how the mass distribution evolves. Really moving particles can be traced on a computer rather easily. The motion of baryons cannot be traced at all easily because the baryons operate in a complex way. You have to worry about shocks. You have to worry about star formation. You have to worry about exploding stars and what they do. In short, uh, the concept of dark matter simplified our understanding of how the universe evolved and structure grew. In the 1980s, I could think of other ways to solve the observational problems with too much baryons. Um, I, I threw out a few ideas. Uh, they were not welcome. In fact, they were not all that elegant, so I, I have no complaints. But it is an interesting contrast, the enthusiasm with which dark matter was adopted and the resistance to the, the adoption of the cosmological constant. Human psychology. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have one more question. Okay. At the end of your Nobel lecture, uh, you ended your Nobel lecture saying, I have so many more unsolved problems that I would leave for the next generations to solve. Would you please be kind enough to elaborate on some of at least one or two of such problems that you would like us to try to even understand? <clears throat> you understand there are many problems. I am being very generous. There are more than ever you will care to think about. But I do have in mind this approach. Um, but first, I should say, this is a time in cosmology of large projects, big science. A satellite sent out, for example, to identify angular positions of billions of galaxies. Wonderful stuff to do. But you know, it's a continuation of what I was doing in the 1970s already, uh, pushing forward along the same direction. It's a good idea to push in the same direction with more and more detail because you know it's worked in the past, we we'll may learn something new. But it's always a good idea too to pause and think, is there something different that I can think about? I am taken by the thought that we have well-defined evidence, well-established evidence for the evolution of the universe, because a lot of it depends on that sea of microwave radiation and its properties. And the properties are computed in linear perturbation theory. That is something wonderfully simple and reliable. And it is the reliability of the predictions along with the reliability of the measurements that gives us a compelling case. I put it to you as another example that uh, the star mass function, the frequency distribution of stellar masses, 
carries a history of the evolution of the universe because there are old stars and young in different abundances, different chemical elements. But untangling that information is impossible because they're just too complicated. Again, the properties of our Milky Way carries a record of cosmic evolution, but it's so complicated to understand. There are then clues that are complex and difficult to understand, clues that are simple. In between, there are also lines of research to consider. In between, there are distributions of galaxies. On large scales, those distributions are average out through small fluctuations. It can be computed in linear perturbation theory. That goes under the name of Baryon acoustic oscillation. On, intermediate, on slightly smaller scales, we have clusters of galaxies. They're kind of complex, but not too bad, and people do very well with numerical simulations of how they form. What would be the next step? It would be to look at the distribution of galaxies on small scales outside of rich clusters. For example, for example, we have nearby a large hole in the distribution of galaxies, nearby a giant void. At a distance of 10 megaparsecs, roughly a third of space is empty, and the other third contains vast numbers of galaxies, large and small. Why is there that big hole? It's not predicted in the theory. In that big hole, the local void, there is one dwarf galaxy. These properties are not at all well understood. And uh, I wonder why there is not big science directed to the opportunity to examine that dwarf galaxy sitting in its splendid isolation so close to us, but surely we can learn things by understanding more of its properties. For example, it, it, it consists of a cloud of stars and a big cloud of hydrogen. The two are tilted relative to each other. Why in the world are they tilted? Well, anyway, these are directions that are not receiving as much attention as I would have thought. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. We will try and think on those lines if ever we get into yeah. the field of research. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, as uh, Professor already mentioned, so all of these pro problems which are going to fall to the next generation of researchers. So, that's why passing on knowledge uh, is very important and also kindling the fire of curiosity. That's why even uh, the study of physics is trying to do. So, uh, kindling interest is very important. So, Advit's question is related to that. Advit, would you like to go? Yeah, uh, good morning, sir, and good evening to everyone else here. Uh, my name is Advait. I'm doing my master's uh, course here. And uh, uh, what I have observed is we have, especially in our country, we have a lot of good researchers and scientists. And, uh, and most of them are teaching students at either an undergraduate level or a postgraduate or a doctoral level. But I have uh, seen that not a lot of them are very good at communicating science or communi communicating the knowledge that they have. And uh, so what do you think is uh, what uh, in, in what way can we improve? How, how can we make scientists better teachers? <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> teaching, um, teaching, teaching. Uh, you know, uh, I never had instruction on teaching. No one ever put me, took me aside and said, here is what you should do, here is what you should avoid doing. Uh, I simply started teaching. I have no idea how, how I learned, except to say, by practice, how do we get our fellows, I, I, I believe I may, may claim that I am a good teacher. I always got good reports from my students. I liked teaching because I learned a lot. You, you know, if you're a good teacher, you'll learn almost as much as your students because there will be many aspects to the physics 
that you had never bothered to consider. But then you ask yourself, what if I'm asked about this? I'd better prepare. And sometimes even I'm caught off guard while teaching. A student asks a simple question, but I don't have a ready answer because I'd never thought of it. Uh, so teaching is a wonderful uh, experience on both sides. How do you persuade all of the teachers who are very good physicists to be better teachers as well as better uh, experts on, on physics? I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps you should speak up the next time you attend a lecture and offer a few hints. You will have to be careful, but you might try. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, I'll surely try that. This is uh, similar to the whole uh, Feynman's technique, uh, as a lot of people know it, that when you're trying to learn some topic, you try to teach it to someone. And while you're teaching it, while you're explaining it, you might understand what gaps do you have in your own knowledge. So it kind of goes both with, you know, uh, how to teach better. If you know the subject well enough, you will be able to communicate it better and and you will also get to learn. That's well put. So, thank you, thank you so much, sir, for your insight. Uh, so, uh, uh, even though we all have like goals in academia and all, we always have this dreams or like particular uh, backup plans which we have. So, Jay uh, has a question related to that. Jay, would you like to go ahead? Uh, good morning, sir. So. Uh, my question is basically what other field would you have taken up if not physics or basically what other research uh, uh, it uh, encourages you other than physics? Well, I think since a young age, I, I was interested in physics, although I only understood what research in physics means when I got to the University of Manitoba. I think I think I was destined to be a physicist, uh, but I do feel an affinity with the world around us, whether it be, oh, the plants growing in the yard next door, or the forest that we have some left in New Jersey to walk through, or geology. I really enjoy the world around us on all scales. And, you know, I particularly find romantic the subject of archaeology. The complex evolution of the species, including our own, is fascinating. Um, we should bear in mind that there are so many lines of research. Simply an understanding the nature of the world around us, from subatomic particles to cosmology and in between so much more. I think I could have enjoyed being very much being an archeologist and finding small clues in old sites to what people were doing a thousand years ago, a million years ago. Fascinating. And it might even uh, somehow be in line with what I enjoy about cosmology. The kind of cosmology I enjoy is that in which we search for clues in remnants left from earlier phases of evolution of the universe. They could be, well, light element abundances, an important clue, could be dwarf galaxies. They somehow formed in isolated regions. How do they form? And we find clues in the way the stars are moving, in the way the hydrogen is distributed around them. What was happening? And in a similar way, if I were left with a midden heap and simply with a sifter, I sift through, I find a little piece of bone from a chicken or whatever. That's also fascinating. It's the world and how it evolved. And I like, I like to think of that. And I like also to have tangible clues. So I would not be a theoretical archaeologist. I would be a practicing a practicing a practicing science in in uh, in archaeology. Fascinating to consider how our how our world has grown. We've kind of overrun the planet, 
But um, we had earlier phases that are just fascinating to consider. So, uh, just as a like little side question, uh, do you have any uh, favorite prehistoric creature, like any particular one that you are really fascinated about? No, no. <laughs> people. Prehistoric people. How did they get along? What were their views of the universe? Uh, so, uh, uh, Professor, uh, so like as I'm sure everyone is aware uh, from Sharvari's Sh presentation also, Professor's uh, field is the Lambda CDM model of, the, of cosmo cosmology. So, Professor, uh, would you like to elaborate uh, how it's different from uh, the the earlier early accepted model? The earlier model, I'm sorry, What which earlier model have you in mind? Uh, so the in, in any of um, like bef bef the model which was preceded, uh, like the one which was accepted before this was, I think uh, I'm not sure particularly, but well, a steady I, state, a uh, steady state model. We have the steady state model. Yeah. Which is elegant. That's an important consideration. In the years when it was introduced and through the 1960s, the steady state theory had a wonderful, wonderfully important property. It made definite predictions of how the counts of galaxies should vary with their brightness in the sky, for example. The evolving, the expanding universe theory cannot make these definite predictions because uh, in an evolving universe, galaxies evolve. So when you are looking out to great distance, you are seeing galaxies as they were in the past because of the late travel time. And to compare distant galaxies with nearby ones, you have to understand how they've been evolving, an exceedingly difficult problem. The steady state theory was only popular in certain areas. Where I grew up, where I was a graduate student, it was dismissed as silly, unfairly, because we paused to think that the cosmology that was favored here in the 1960s was as artificially constructed as the steady state theory was constructed out of hypotheses that had no particular experimental evidence. Uh, the theory was finally falsified, I think most clearly, as some of the earlier speakers said, through the discovery of the microwave radiation. And put aside, but of course, as Fred Hoyle liked to emphasize, it has a lot in common with inflation. In the 1960s, this, the more favored model was the Big Bang Theory. I should pause to mention that with emphasis that the word Big Bang is quite inappropriate because the theory we have does not refer to a, a bang, which is localized in space time. It, it refers to the evolution of the universe, which is in the theory and in observations now, uh, the same everywhere, a good approximation. The theory that was popular in the years around 1990 was the CDM theory. Perhaps that's what you have in mind. It added the cold dark matter, but it continued to assume that the universe is Einstein to sitter, that is to say, no cosmological constant, no, uh, no space curvature. That theory was very popular then. To me, not justifiably so, apart from its simplicity, uh, the, the Lambda CDM theory, which I introduced in 1984, uh, was not popular. It was almost as simple, but it had this cosmological constant. And you know, the cosmological constant is a really, really strange, difficult to understand term. We have, as I'm sure you're well aware, 
quantum zero-point energy, which we know is real and gravitates, you get the wrong answer for structures of particles, molecules, atoms. Uh, if you don't include the zero-point energy, it's real and it gravitates. The same quantum physics that tells us that the zero-point energy is present and the experiments tell us it's real predicts that gravitation, the electromagnetic field has zero-point energy, but alas, with an absurdly large value. If it's Lorentz and covariant, uh, this theory is a cosmological constant with a ridiculous value. That cosmological constant, therefore, is so strange, it has the property of Lorentz covariant zero-point energy, but the wrong value by an enormous factor. What in the world does that mean? The simple answer is there is some symmetry of nature yet to be discovered that requires that the vacuum zero, the vacuum energy density vanishes. Alas, we don't have the theory, and we have the curious phenomenon. So in the 1990s until toward the end, uh, it was CDM. And it was not really rational, but people are not always rational. And you know, in the end, we all swung around because the evidence drove us. Right, Professor, thank you. Uh, Shabri, I think you have a question. Uh, hello, Professor. This is Sharvari from MSc Part 2. Uh, I would like to ask that what is the significance of the inconsistencies between the measured value of Hubble parameter between lambda CMB and local Hubble measurement? Yes, you are referring to the Hubble parameter, which is inferred in two different ways. One, by looking at distances and recession velocities of galaxies. The other, by fitting to the theory of interaction of plasma and radiation in the early universe, the acoustic oscillations, the remnants that appear as waves in the power spectra of the distributions of matter and radiation. It's a fascinating puzzle, uh, uh, and I am of three minds about it. First, the Lambda CDM has passed so many other tests, but surely, surely it will pass this one too. Surely there is some slight systematic error in the measurement. I would like to think that, but I really am dissuaded by the fact that people are very well aware of the hazard of systematic errors. People have ex anxiously, closely examined these measurements on both sides and have failed to find a resolution. So uh, I'm then of the mind, well, it's a great discovery to be made. Uh, let us, though, bear in mind one other possibility. If this discrepancy is real, it means that lambda CDM is not right. But you know, no one ever said lambda CDM theory is right. We've always said, or we should always say, it is an approximation. And being approximations, it must at some point show discrepancies that would point us to a better theory. But I would draw your attention to one other point, my third mine. The two values of the Hubble parameter differ by about 10 percent. They refer to phenomena in the present universe and to phenomena set by events at redshift a thousand. That is to say, the decoupling of plasma and radiation when the universe was 1,000 times smaller in linear dimension than it is now. You consider, therefore, that this approximate theory traced evolution by a factor of a thousand and was off by 10 percent. I say that's very good. Lambda CDM is a very good approximation, so it's not perfect. No one ever said it should is perfect, although, or in fact, I'm sure many have said it, but they shouldn't have. We follow with interest uh, as people worry about this. 
And I think the main point of interest now is to ask if there is this anomaly, uh, if this anomaly with the Hubble parameter is real, then surely there will be anomalies in the constraints on other of the parameters of lambda CDM. The mean mass density, the uh, baryon mass density, expansion times. We have all of these checks. They must show up inconsistencies. Surely it won't be confined only to the Hubble parameter. As more inconsistencies show up, as I hope they will, we will have a better clue to how to remedy the error and get a better theory than lambda CDM. But I think my main point at the moment is simply that given that the error is 10% in expansion factor of 1,000, I'm looking for a small adjustment, not a revolutionary change. There are those who say this is a revolutionary challenge. I don't agree with that. I think this is a fine adjustment. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like to ask another question, like okay. what are the interesting open areas beyond the standard lambda CDM model of cosmology? Well, of course, there's all the rest of physics. There's so much to do. Uh, one, one piece of advice I always offer to young people is look around. See what's, see what's happening in various fields that might fascinate you. There are so many. Uh, I think research in cosmology is by no means complete. We have this anomaly, for example. We have many more if you stop to look, look for them. But on the other hand, uh, there are other areas of physics that are so open. Of course, the big one is, is biophysics. It's just so... Uh, complex and at the same time so important as a practical matter for society and also as a, as a matter of fundamental interest. How in the world does living matter operate? Um, in cosmology, I think the, the answer is, to me, to look at this interface between the complex, which I would say is galaxies down to you and me, and the other side the simplicity of the universe on the largest scales. There's a lot of phenomena between those two cases that uh, is sure to teach us a lot. Uh, thank you, Professor. I have started working in the field of cosmology. This was very insightful, and it's a really dream came true to have this opportunity to converse with you. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor, like uh, I think this is one of the YouTube questions too. Uh, so, Ashish, this is also like a question. I think you are in the meet. So, could you go ahead with your question? Um, so, so uh, last toward the end of last year, a paper was released that uh, possibly uh, said about the detection of external field effects in several galaxies, and this sort of brought in the modified Newtonian dynamics theory, the Mond theory, into picture. Do you think this would possibly challenge the dark matter hypothesis that is currently uh, the center stage of, uh, do you think it will possibly challenge that? <clears throat> um, I, I do not think it is a serious challenge. I, on the other hand, think it is a very good idea to continue to think about the Mond hypothesis. I think not for a beginning student, because it is too speculative. But there is always a possibility that Mond is teaching us something important. You recall that the idea from Milgram, Monty Milgram, very sensibly asked the question, why do you trust the inverse square law of gravity on the immense scales of galaxies and groups and clusters of galaxies? And he pointed out, quite rightly, others have seen the same thing, that uh, if the law of gravity were adjusted ever so slightly, so that in large scales, the acceleration varies inversely as the first power of separation rather than the second, then a lot of the problems with uh, dark matter go away. 
the difficulty, of course, is bringing that philosophy and that schematic idea into a theory that can be tested by, by comparison to all of the phenomena that fit so well with lambda CDM. It seems to me almost impossible that that will happen, but of course it's not, it's not impossible. There's always a possibility of some brilliant new idea. It would overthrow lambda CDM. As I said earlier, I don't see much chance of that happening. I'm so impressed with the test that the theory has passed so far. But I still think that we should pay attention to the notion of Mond, because it's always possible that it has something to teach us. Thank you, Professor. Well, you know, I should remark also that the phenomenon, the Mond prediction of the relation between the baryon, baryonic mass and velocity distribution within a galaxy is remarkably good. There are properties of galaxies that are well established phenomenologically, but that in my opinion are not well understood by the present theory of galaxy formation. That's not a complaint. Understanding the formation and evolution of galaxies is a very deep challenge. There are people working very hard on it by making, and they are making progress. But my bet is they still have things to learn, in particular, to understand the apparent success of MOND on the scale of individual galaxies. Oh, that's Thank you. Uh, so we've received a lot of questions actually, but I do not think we have time for a lot of them because Professor, as you know, is very busy. Uh, so I think we'll go uh, ahead with this one question, and then if if Professor uh, has uh, like ten more minutes, maybe we can address a few more questions. Uh, so Professor, it's your discussion. Would you like to go ahead with a few more questions, or um, shall we? Cool. All right, ten more minutes, and then we will stop. All right, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, so a theory of everything. So this is also from uh, the YouTube chats. Uh, so a theory of everything or a master theory, a single encompassing coherent theoretical framework of physics that fully explains and links together all physical aspects of the universe uh, is one of the major unsolved problems in physics. Uh, Anand, uh, your question and one of the people in YouTube was asked, uh, a lot of people on YouTube asked the same question. So would you like to go ahead with this? So yes, uh, so uh, I... Uh came across this article which mentioned uh, something called time being an emergent property of the universe and the same concept has been used in some of the theories of everything and quantum gravity theories so i just wanted to know more about it well, it is something i would like to know more about too the problem is that these ideas are so well so ill-formed, so, so loose, that it's difficult to see what to make of them. Uh, one philosophical point, we asked ourselves, is there a theory of everything? Is there a fundamental theory on which all other theories rest? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's impossible to know because the best theory we will ever have is the theory that we can afford to test. You understand that uh, testing particle physics theory is very expensive. Big accelerators are constructed at enormous expense to check for the existence of the Higgs particle. Brilliant results, the Higgs detected. Its properties sound mysterious. That's exciting, things, to, things for a theorist to, to consider. But as the theories get more and more deep, they get more and more complica complicated, inevitably. And so uh, it is, in my thinking, impossible in principle to know whether there is a theory of everything or whether uh, the theory, the final theory, will be the best one we can afford. In other words, another way to put it, uh, we know that there are levels of, of approximations in physics. 
we have Maxwell's equations, which are wonderfully powerful and important. We pay close attention to them, but we were, we're aware they're only an approximation, a limiting case of quantum electrodynamics. It is a wonderful theory, thoroughly tested, but we know it is only a limited case, or at least we believe, of the electroweak theory. And the electroweak theory, we imagine, is an approximate, is a limiting case of some deeper theory that unifies uh, all of the forces of nature. We have gone through layers of detail. Is there a bottom layer or is it layers of successive approximations all the way down? I think this is something we will never know. I cannot say anything much about uh, the entropic theories that uh, you and I are up. I cannot say much about the entropic theory. I don't pay too much attention because to my taste, the phenomenology is more fascinating. Others have different opinions, of course, which is important. Uh, right, so developing such theories actually require a lot of creativity to imagine the universe has never been done before and ha hanging the mathematical prowess, having the mathematical prowess to prove the same. And this is a skill mastered with experience as Professor Peebles already mentioned. So uh, this is a question on YouTube and I think Hitanshu's question is much the same. So Hitanshu, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes, am I audible? Yeah, clear. Hello, Professor. Uh, my question to you is that in your Nobel interview, you mentioned that your professor, Bob Dickey, would turn hostile if you are sloppy in your thinking. What does it mean to be thinking in a quote-unquote sloppy manner? Huh. And how can students and researchers know if they're thinking in the right direction? Only with great care. I think what he had in mind is people who spoke in haste without bothering to consider obvious aspects of the question that if considered would have caused the speaker to decide not to speak. Bob Dickey was a wonderful physicist. I think he, he taught me a lot. Um, and in particular, he certainly taught me to respect the phenomenology. He made mistakes. We all do. But what he meant and what is so important is that you give thought to what you say. As simple as that. On the other hand, John Wheeler, another great physicist, once remarked, I like to give lectures because I understand what I have in mind. He didn't seem to be thinking ahead. Of course he was. But by speaking, he understood better what he meant. Perhaps that's also what Feynman had in mind. It is the two aspects of thinking. One, being careful, and two, thinking outside the box without being silly, a challenge. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I think this is this will be the last question. We don't want to take Professor's valuable time anymore. Yeah. And already we have overshot the time maybe on. So uh, Neil, uh, this is one of the YouTube questions too. Uh, so would you like to go ahead with your question? Yeah, hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is more of a career-oriented question, and I just uh, kept it for the last because I thought it just might get slightly serious. So uh, the job market for academics after every generation after yours has shrunk with uh, less and less permanent positions for researchers. Uh, in and the increasing uh, competition is kind of making a lot of people feel very disenfranchised about future pro their future prospects uh, in research uh, and how they go about it. So would you have any advice for uh, young researchers when it comes to the uncertainties of academics? The uncertainties are very real. You are right. Uh, it is not a good thing. Uh, one, one obvious piece of advice to bear in mind 
you must make yourself visible in positive ways by publishing papers that are not too speculative. You understand the two imperatives for a physicist, be original, but be sensible. The two do not always agree. You should not uh, write papers that are at all deeply speculative and have them published because those who do become marked as someone who maybe is unreliable. On the other hand, you must publish research papers if you were to get ahead. And uh, the trick is always to make the papers interesting, but not offensively speculative. I can't put it better than that. Uh, but it is certainly true. Your most effective, your most effective pieces of evidence will be the experience of your advisors who will write letters on your behalf. And the other will be your publication of research papers that are interesting enough to capture the, the attention of those who might want to hire you. How you do that? Well, it's a matter between you and your advisor. You should have an advisor and you should be talking about how to make yourself visible. I can only add one other thought. Although positions for research and teaching in academia are limited, there is the vast world of industry that really does need the expertise of physicists. They're not always aware of it, but they do need it. And that line of, I think, is almost abundantly open for positions. You must be practical in that case. You must have some skills that are practical. Well worth considering though. I might add that there are still other jobs. For example, newspapers report advances in science. Sometimes they're horribly misinformed because they were written by someone who wasn't trained in physics. A good physicist in a job like that reporting on science to the public can do a lot of good and you can also find it rewarding. Well, there are many options. Um, you have my sympathy though in thinking it's a challenging time. Maybe I should add that I entered the job market in around the early 1960s, not long after World War II, and it was a time when industry was deeply impressed by war research that had given us, well, not only the atomic bomb, but also radar, many other technologies. There were lots of jobs then. Uh, so I had it very easy. Uh, there was never a problem of this sort. Society has changed. Uh, we have become obsessed with budgets. So that is a real problem, and you certainly have my sympathy in uh, facing up to it, but alas, you have to. Thank you for yeah, uh, everyone is really glad all the responses in the chats are really lighting up. Uh, everyone loved your talk and the discussion. The, the session was really great. So uh, for the vote of thanks, uh, we have Akshita, the head of editorials for Sigma Phi, the Society of Physics. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And good morning, Professor. I'm Akshita Makita. Um, so honorable Professor James Peebles, respected faculty members and our invited guests. It is my privilege to offer Thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of the Society of Physics, Sigma Phi, and the entire Department of Physics at St. Xavier's College, thank you for honoring us with your presence. We were spellbound to be having been part of such an insightful discussion. Your intake on different topics in cosmology and a thorough answer to our questions was truly inspiring. I offer my sincere thanks to our volunteers for organizing everything so well and making this event a success. 
thank you to our lovely audience for taking interest in this interactive session and asking great questions. We are grateful to our faculty members from St. Xavier's College for guiding us through this event. In conclusion, I would like to say that it is our curiosity that has led us here. Our want for answers and the need to ask questions is what has led to the progression of science. I am sure by listening to such inspiring personalities like our speaker, we, the younger generation, will aspire to achieve great things. On this note, I would like to end this session. Thank you, everyone. It has been my great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Professor. Goodbye. Yes. Have a good day, sir. All right, sir. I think we have had a very nice session. And uh, Uh, Ma'am, Kevin has got logged out from the meeting, so. Yeah, yeah. and Professor Peebles has also left the meeting, I suppose. Yes, ma'am. Oh. I think Kevin is back, I guess. Yeah, so we can also end the session, I suppose, now. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right then.